Hey, good morning, church. How are you this morning? Amazing, amazing. Yes, I, uh, I didn't realize that it snowed on Thursday until I was packing, and I was like, it's going to be how cold? I mean, you guys are built different up here. Like, I'm Mexican. We're tropical people. We don't do this out here. We just do not do that. And so uh, you, are, you are definitely on, a, on another level than the rest of us in the South, but the truth is it's so inspiring to come around this incredible leadership uh, at this church and multiple churches represented uh, at a live conference. It was truly a special weekend, and I only got to dip in uh, last night, but I think uh, when you have amazing opportunities to sow and seed uh, into the next generation and you have these type of gatherings, make no mistake, nobody leaves the same. Everybody leaves completely transformed. And I think it's a, a pure reflection of quality leadership uh, in, in your pastors. Come on, do you love Pastor Weaver? Come on, you can thank God for Pastor Weaver. And of course, who doesn't love Pastor Jeff and Pastor Jeannie? Come on, do you love Pastor Jeff, Pastor Jeannie? Pastor Zach, Pastor Luke, Pastor August, you guys are incredible how you carried yourselves through. I'm surprised that you're awake uh, at 8.30 in the morning after an all-nighter and everything else. But I am truly honored and humbled to be here. I feel like it's a gathering of eagles, and so I want to speak to a, a room like that. But uh, as you might know, I, this, is, this is my first time at this church, so I got a lot of new friends in the room. So let me tell you my story so you know where this crazy Mexican is coming from, okay? Um, I grew up on the border of the United States and Mexico, and you probably have heard of my city at one point, but for all the wrong reasons, because nobody would vacation in my city. You only go there for two reasons. Number one, to visit family, or number two, to do something illegal. That's the, I'm not lying. That's the only reason, my whole life. I'm telling you, uh, if you heard about all the cartel wars, all the drug trafficking, all the human trafficking, okay, those are all my cousins. <laughs> so Christmas was fun or the FBI was kicking in someone's front door in my family. There was never a dull moment. And so by the age of 12, I found myself with a drug addiction, a lust problem, and an anger issue. But I love to play basketball. Come on, Iowa. Anybody love to hoop in here? Yeah, and so I would go to this church that had a gym. They'd open it right before the youth service to fill the gym and then get the students into the service. Well, in that transition, I would dip and leave and find somewhere else to play. But the youth pastor got involved in my life, and one day he came to me and he said, hey, do you want to go to church camp? Now, church, honestly, I had no idea what this was. I was a wicked little kid, all right? He said, do you want to go to church camp? I said, is there going to be hot girls at this camp? Is there going to be five women at the, I was a 16-year-old little pervert. I had no idea what I was saying. And, and he said, uh, he, he said, well, we're going to go for Jesus. I said, fine, you can go for Jesus. I'm going to get some phone numbers. <laughs> I'm going to camp. What I didn't realize is on the first night of that camp, I got saved, I got filled with the Holy Spirit, and called into ministry all in one night. Absolutely transformative night in my life, and from that point forward, I went into Bible college, went into business for myself, uh, became a missionary to Sri Lanka, uh, uh, took over a student ministry at a sweeping revival, and really, the last 15 years of my life, I've dedicated to raising and releasing this next wave of influencers and voices that I believe are going to be holy disruptions in every sphere of society. Come on, I'm talking about in medicine, education, government, business, in the church. I believe this is the type of revival that God's a full-on blitz into society. And, uh, and now we get to do this by carrying a vision uh, with Love Has No Limits where our, our heart is to unite the global church for the salvation and transformation of nations. And I'll unpack a little bit more later on what that looks like, but I, I can't think of a better place to be than right here at New Hope. Come on, you excited about being in church this morning? My wife says hello. We're going to celebrate 20 years of marriage this year. Come on, that's a record. Can we just thank God right there? That is a record. That's a first. I have the longest first marriage in my family. So I'm breaking records and curses out here, people. All right, so, uh, but we have four amazing kids. She wants more. I don't. Pray for her, not me, okay? <laughs> Something broken with that woman. But I do believe God has given me a word for this hour and uh, I just want to know if there's any hunger in the room. Is anybody hungry for a word from the Lord? Come on, talk to me. All right, do me a favor. Turn on your Bible and go to 2 Kings 6. Yeah, yeah 2 Kings. <laughs> I, they did that last night. I was like, wow, nobody's ever cheered when we say you want to turn on your Bible. But uh, turn on your Bible. 2 Kings chapter 6, we're going to find ourselves in the middle uh, of a journey through the prophet Elisha. I love Elisha. I love Elisha so much, I named my oldest son after this prophet. And you'll find that uh, throughout this, this 
uh, text of history in Israel's pathway, you'll find that the king of Syria is always creating conflict with the nation of Israel. And several times he will come up with these wicked, demonically inspired ideas to invade into the land. And so he would call, as soon as he gets the idea, he would call all his circle advisors and give them the idea and, and the strategy, and their job was to deploy and execute it. And sure enough, when as soon as it left his mouth, the Bible says it also ended up in a pair of ears that he didn't expect, and it was the prophet Elisha. The Bible says that this happened time and again. So this didn't just happen one time. This happened all the time where the prophet would hear the wicked plans, and he would report it back to the king of Israel. And he would say, hey, you need to send garrisons and reinforcements. You're about to be invaded by at such and such place. And they were able to fight off the surprise attack. Again, this happened over and over. So finally this wicked king gets so frustrated that he calls that same circle of advisors, his generals, his counselors, his advisors, and he, and he pulls them in and he says, all right, which of you is the traitor? Who is informing our plans to the king of Israel? And they're like, oh, 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 it's not us, my lord, the king. They have a prophet who hears everything you say even in the privacy of your own bedroom. Come on, that's awkward. Let's just be honest. Can we be human for a second? That's just awkward. The Bible hits you some kind of way, right? And he says, well, tell me where this prophet is. He says, that, well, the prophet's in Dothan, which means cutting, and that's a whole different uh, message right there. He says, well, send a whole army that I may seize him. So he's sending a whole army for one guy, and this is where we're gonna begin eating right here in verse 14, 2 Kings chapter six. It says, so one night, the king of Syria sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. When the servant of the man of God got up early the next morning, went outside, there were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. Oh, sir, what will we do now? The young man cried to Elisha, don't be afraid. Come on, there's some strength in those words. Don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for there are more with us than against us. Then Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes. Would you say that with me? Open and let him see. Then the Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. As the Aramean army began to advance toward him, Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, please make them blind. So the Lord struck them with blindness exactly as Elisha had asked. Man, there is so much here to unpack, and we're going to taste it all like a bucket of chicken. But first, we're going to pray. We're going to pray. Holy Spirit, I ask for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus Christ to flood every heart. I speak to this atmosphere, and I say that you are full of faith, you are full of hope, you are full of peace and you're full of joy and I come against every limit, every restriction, every barrier, every lie, every demonic harassment I say is broken right now in Jesus' name. And I call every man and every woman into their season. I call them into their rhythm. I call them into their greatness, into their grace land, God. And I ask that you would ignite fresh vision, fresh strategy, fresh purpose, and fresh revelation in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone shout it. Amen, amen. I, I want to give you my title, but I want to I want to preface it with this. All right, I have no cultural, political agenda attached to my title. When I was walking deep in God, when in this uh, subject, I, I felt like when God gave us this message, I thought this is a dope title. We're going to call it this. I want to talk to you from this place called Stay Woke. I am not talking about a natural wokeness that is clear and present on the earth that only notices problems. I am talking about a spiritual wokeness where you don't just notice the problem, you also know the answer. You don't just see the pain, you know how to heal it. You don't just see the issue, God will give you a strategy on how to solve it. Are you with me? There is something about people who have been woken up into this reality of God that I am not just here to be Sunday service members. I am here to be a walking revival with legs that the enemy has no strategy against. And I plan on being a holy nightmare against the kingdom of darkness every day of my life. Come on, the Bible says at one point we were dead in our sins, but when we were baptized, we were raised to life again. And he 
woke us up in the kingdom realities, in the kingdom truths, in the what Jesus and who Jesus is. We need woke people again. I'm not talking about people who are moved by headlines, newsreels, social media feeds, culture wars, and hashtags. I'm talking about people who have spent time in the place of prayer and intercession, who have fasted an extra day, who will worship a little longer, who will take the extra whisk. Do I have any woke people in here this morning? Okay. I really feel like there's some people who think that Sunday morning is gonna get it done for their life. It will not. There are some things in your life that are not automatic. We tend to think that everything in God's kingdom is automatic, Let me, or it's at least free. You know what, salvation, that's free. Holy Spirit, he's free. Grace, that's free. Obedience, that will cost you. Discipline, that will cost you. Are you following me? There is something about people who have been woken up into the things of God that understand he will come and ask for everything. And we need woke people. Stay woke. I remember one time I was coming out of the gym, and don't be that impressed, it was a dodgeball tournament. And, and, and I don't know about anybody else, but I hate to lose. Anybody else? Like, I don't play just to play. I don't know where we learned this, this demonic ideology about, well, let's just play to have fun. No, I play to win. It don't matter what it is. It don't matter if it's a matching game with my seven-year-old or a video game with my six-year-old. I plan on destroying you. And I don't make no excuses about it either. Don't come crying to me like, Daddy, how come you don't give me no extra chances, Daddy? And how come you don't give me a head start, Daddy? And how, hey, you're saved, but you're not soft. You better take that sissy stuff out of here. You're an Estrada. You know, and don't go cry to their mother. Their mother's worse than I am. All right? And so, like, I, re I remember I'm leaving the gym because we got eliminated early from a dodgeball tournament. I don't want to talk about it. And so I remember we're walking out, and, and Pastor Joe, I get this text message on my phone. It actually it comes in three messages. You know these people who like could send one text message, but they have attention seeking problems and they have to hit you three times and it could just be once. Somebody, I see people Elvin like, he's talking to you. You're gonna get saved. <laughs> I remember I get this text message and the text message is, uh, uh, yo, what's up? That's in the first one. Yo, what's up? Next text message. Is this Darnisha? Next text message. This Antoine from Saturday night. Now, Honest to God, Pastor Jeff, honest to God, I meant to text back, this is not Darnisha. But the autocorrect on my phone sent back, this is Darnisha. <laughs> to which Antoine hit back, sup, girl. <laughs> so I didn't have anything else to do. So I just texted back, nothing, he, 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 emoji, 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 and baby, it was on. Now, I, I, you're like, he is, I am that pastor, all right? I have been depressed. I like joy a lot better. And anytime you're with me, we're gonna have fun. I promise you that. We're gonna have fun. We're gonna have so much fun. We might get arrested. Well, handcuffed, but not arrested. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's where we're gonna go. And so, I remember uh, Antoine said, what you doing right now? And I said, well, I just got out of the gym. I'm kind of tired. He said, well, you should go to bed. I'm thinking, oh, oh, oh. look at Antoine. 10 seconds into my life, speaking godly direction into my life. So anyone that knows me, I like to go to bed early. I go to bed at nine, I wake up at five almost every day. This, I've always been like this since high school. And so I, I remember I, um, I'm lying in bed. Anyone that knows me knows if you text me after 10, or I'm sorry, after nine, you're not gonna text me back till the next morning. And so I'm lying in bed, falling asleep. My wife's next to me, she's reading her Bible. <laughs> she's the real Christian, I'm just the preacher. And so I, I'm falling asleep and all of a sudden I hear the on my phone, just like that, just like that. And I'm thinking, that could only be one person. Sure enough, it was Antoine. Antoine says, sweet dreams, baby girl. <laughs> so I was lying in bed, texting me, I was like, <laughs> and I was laughing, I was like, <laughs> he don't even know, he don't even know. I'm like all hyping myself up, and then my wife says, who's that? I said, that's Antoine. <laughs> you ever try to make something sound normal? I said, that's Antoine. She said, who's Antoine, what does he want? I said, he, he, uh, he want to talk to Darnisha. She said, who's Darnisha? I said, well, life's funny. I said, I'm Darnisha. She said, you're a married man pretending to be a woman talking to another man. I said, babe, when you say it like that, it sounds bad. This went on for two weeks. 
Oh, yes, it did. Oh, yeah, I'm telling you, I'm going to have a good time. You around me, we're going to have a good time, right? This went on, and I would have kept it going forever, but one day Antoine hit back. He said, hey, I want to see you again. Y- yeah. yeah you, you and I both know the next time he sees Darnisha, he's going he to notice some things have changed. <laughs> Maybe upgraded, I don't know, but things are different, right? He said, hey, I want to see you again. I knew that as soon as he saw me, he would recognize I am not who I said I was. And I think that's exactly what the kingdom of darkness is fretting over right now. God has exposed every lie. He has lifted every veil. And he is giving prophetic accuracy to your sight so that you will not be intimidated, that you will not disqualify yourself, that you will not ruin marriages, that you will not ruin your voice in your children's lives because God is waking you up. And there is a piercing sight that is coming on the body of Christ where they're seeing through all the smoke screens, through all the fog, through all the flutter and the fluff of the day, and they can see the clear purposes of God. And it only belongs to people who stay woke. We need people who can see beyond the average. We need people who can see beyond the, the news report, beyond the social media feed, beyond the, my goodness, if, if we prayed as much as we posted, we'd actually change some things. We need people who are waking up to what is God's plan and what's God's purposes. And I believe that what God is doing is he's calling us to this place where stay woke. Here's the first thing. If you're going to stay woke, number one, number one, this is the first thing you have to say with your life. I'm ahead. I live ahead. I don't live behind. Nobody knows more. I'm always ahead. We have a holy unfair advantage over the kingdom of darkness. God has put his spirit on the inside of us for us to know exactly when we are in his will and when we have stepped out of it for a season because he wants to keep us ahead. You know, I've met too many incredible believers that want to believe or that think that they are always behind or even I've met people who think they, that somehow the enemy knows more about their life than they do. That's not even true. That's not even biblical. Our enemy is not omniscient. He's not omnipresent. He's not any of that. What he does recognize is spiritual habits and characteristics. He recognizes that when you begin to pray and fast, he says that's the same way that Catherine Kuhlman used to pray and fast. And it launched uh, 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 women across the earth in numbers that they had never known. That's the same way that Smith Wigglesworth used to pray. And it, uh, it ushered in a miracle revival into nations across the globe. That's the same way that so-and-so used to fast. That's the same way. And he notices these things pick up in your life and he immediately gets nervous. All because God knows he's going to keep you ahead. Did not the Bible say time and again? Time and again, the, the prophet Elisha would hear what this wicked king is about to do. You know, I, I had this student uh, in, our, in our youth ministry, and uh, he, he, um, he took a nap right before our youth service, and he had a dream. And in the dream, Jesus came to him. And Jesus walked up to him and gave him a gallon Ziploc bag, one of those big Ziploc bags, gave it to him and said, go to the farmer's aisle at this grocery store, and whoever you pray for, I'm going to heal. Kid wakes up out of the dream, jumps in his car, heads to the grocery store. He walks in, sees that the pharmacy aisle is completely packed full of people. And so he, he notices that there's a woman barely just picking up her prescriptions, about to leave, and he gets in her path and says, excuse me, ma'am. He says, listen, I, she says, yeah. He says, listen, I, I'm a Christian, and God speaks to us, and he told me that he wants me to pray for people, and whoever I pray for, Jesus is going to heal He's like, ma'am, can I pray for you about anything? Well, I mean, you just picked up, picked up a bag of pills for something, for something. Either you're in pain, something's off, or you're on that stuff, but something, right? And she said, well, I've had this, this back pain uh, my, for years. It's, it, I take this medication to really take the edge off the pain, but I live with pain. I have to uh, manage my pain. And, and I had this, uh, I got injured. She told him the whole story. He said, no problem. Can I pray for you? She said, absolutely, please. He, he says, can I lay my hand on your shoulder? She said, yes. He prays, very simple prayer. This is like a 16-year-old kid, all right? Very simple prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I command this pain to leave 
her back to be healed and nothing to return. In your name I pray, amen. When he said amen, this lady jumped. She went, whoa, just like that. Whoa, yelled at everything, the whole thing. Whoa, just like that. And he said, what happened? Kind of freaked the kid out. What, what happened? She said, well, I, I felt something move in my back. He said, well, do something you couldn't do before I pray for you. She said, okay. And she went like this. <laughs> Anytime someone's back gets healed, this is what they'd be doing right here. They'd be doing all this right here, right? And she is doing this, and she is starting to cry because God totally heals her back in the front of this grocery store with a pack line of people watching. I mean, people in this line are like, what? Is this a grocery store or church? What's going on? Nobody had any blueprint for this. And so the next person came, and they got healed. Well, an employee started watching what's happening, and this lady whose back got healed, got, she was so confident in her healing, she took her pills and threw them to the kid and walked out the store completely full of, free from her pain. And the employee came over, tears coming down their face, and said, I don't know why, but I'm supposed to give this to you, and she handed the kid a, a gallon Ziploc bag. And so people throughout the line were watching as the next person got healed and the next person got healed and the next person got healed, asthma got healed. I mean, all kinds of stuff was getting healed. And he, then he shows up to church. And I remember I'm walking across the hall into our uh, uh, sanctuary and, and he yells at me. He says, hey, Pastor Chris, hey, check it out. And he's holding up two bags full of pills, all right? He's like, hey, check it out. We taking ground, baby. We taking ground. Ah, devil gonna lose today. I mean, he, this kid had no problem hyping himself up. And, <laughs> And so, I, but I, Mr., I was like, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? I thought he was trying to sell the pills to all the other kids. <laughs> His kids got a pass. So I was like, did we relapse? What happened? Right? And he told me a story. You want to know why that would happen? Because God will keep you ahead. Whether it has to come through a dream, through a friend, through the spirit of God's voice himself, he will keep you ahead. If you're going to stay woke, number one, you get to say, I'm ahead. Number two, you get to say, I'm an ambush. I am not being ambushed, I am an ambush. I am not the threatened, I'm the threat. I am not the minority, I'm the majority. Are you following me? The Bible says that, that this, this servant is freaking out. Oh sir, what will we do now? And Elisha recognizing this cry is not coming from a holy place, it's coming from a place of fear has to speak to it and says, don't be afraid. There are more with us than against us. And then he says, open his eyes, and all of a sudden, boom, the eyes of this kid are open. The eyes can see what he couldn't see in a moment's notice. It's like everything, God peeled back a layer, a reality, and he began to see what the prophet saw. Which, you know, it's pretty interesting to me. You do realize that angel army is still around. You do realize they are still moving on the earth right now. And, you know, I think it's so important to know what your Bible says, especially to have a biblical worldview. I'm not just talking about for an election cycle. I'm talking about for your marriage. I'm talking about for your children. I'm talking about for your job, for the sake of character and integrity, for your way. It's important to know what the Bible says. You know what I think is equally important? To know what your Bible does not say. You know, did you notice what the prophet never prayed about? He never prayed. This, he never went, God, are you with us? God, will you protect us? He never prayed this. Come on, New Hope. He never once prayed, never once had a doubt. God, will you deliver? He never did any of this, right? The biggest problem wasn't even the enemy army he was surrounded by. The biggest problem that he had to pray for was his blind spiritual servant, which tells me this is a picture of what Jesus does for us. The Bible says that he is seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us so that we would not just know what the Spirit wants us to know, but we would see what the Spirit wants us to see. Are you following me? There is something about knowing I am never being ambushed. I am always the ambush. I, I would like to submit to you that since from the beginning of time, God has been trying to get our sight right. It, it, you know, I, you got to read your Bible with some humor. You, you remember, I think it's uh, John chapter 9. Jesus walks up to a blind man. A blind man. A blind man. All right, blind. Can't see. Boom, gone. Nope. Blind man. He walks up to a blind man and says, Hey, 
you want to see? <laughs> and I'm reading, I'm like, sir, he's blind. Like, I don't mean to point out the obvious, but he's blind. But Jesus says, hey, do you want to see? And this man's like, yes, Lord. <laughs> and, he's, and Jesus goes, okay. So Jesus spits in the dirt and makes mud and then takes it and puts it in the guy's eyes. The blind guy don't even see it coming. <laughs> Rubs it in his eyes and says, now, what do you see? And the guy says, I see men walking around like trees. Do you remember this? Right? Remember that response. I see men walking around like trees. And so Jesus is like, okay. He spits in the dirt again, makes more mud, and then takes it and puts it in the blind guy's eyes a second time. The blind guy barely sees it coming. And I'm thinking, Jesus, you're a savage. You play too much. And then he asks him again, now what do you see? And this guy says, I can see clearly now. Now, I want you to notice these two responses. I see men walking around like trees. I can see clearly now. I would like to submit to you that Jesus was healing his spiritual sight before his natural sight. You're like, can you have scripture back this up? I would love to. Because you'll find that any time that trees, uh, trees are constantly likened to people throughout scripture. Remember in Psalms? Blessed is the man who's not walking the way of the wicked, nor standing in the seat of the scornful, nor standing in the, walking the path of the sinner. For his delight is in the law of God, and on the law he will meditate on it day and night. For he will be like a tree who's planted by the river, whose leaves do not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. Jesus said, you know a tree by its fruit. And a good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree bears bad fruit. He's not talking about having a green thumb. He's talking about knowing the people you walk with. There is something about God who has constantly had to get people's sight. Abraham is walking with a promise that he will have a son, the father of many nations, and one day he comes complaining to God, when am I going to get my reward? When am I going to get my inheritance? And, and God tells him, boy, go outside and count the stars. He counts the stars, loses the count, and says, God, there's too many. And God says, exactly, so will your descendants be. On the nation, so will your descendants be. There will be a new more like the grains of sand on the earth. Joshua, a great military leader who is not reckless but ruthless when it came to military strategy. You'll find that he had his own season of doubt as he's taking a walk and he sees a man with a sword drawn. And he tells this man, he says, you for us or against us? And doesn't realize that it's Jesus. And he says, no. He doesn't even answer his question. You for us or for them? Nah. But as, angel, as a commander of the angel armies of heaven, I have now come to show you, see, I've already given you Jericho. He's telling him, I've already given it to you. You haven't even fought the battle. It's already yours. He's getting him to see. All throughout scripture, you will find. God, you know what I've learned? Eyes that look are common. Eyes that see, totally rare. I, I have watched people, I myself have had too many times where I've misread or misinterpreted seasons, circumstances, relationships. And I have to go back and begin to pray, God, would you open up my eyes? And then I begin to see the ways of God and how the ambush is coming, the goodness of God is gonna weaponize perhaps a generation, definitely his church. Here's the last thing, if, if we're gonna stay woke, number three, number three, number three, I'm an answer. I'm, I'm an answer. You know, uh, maybe, You've never heard about what we do at Love Has No Limits or Missions Me, but our heart, our vision is to unite the global church for the salvation and transformation of nations. And we used to have a massive footprint where we would mass mobilize, our, well, not we still do, we mass mobilize armies of missionaries and we would uh, saturate entire nations with seven days of targeted intelligent outreach. Uh, I wish I had time to tell you, like in 2019, we brought 10,000 missionaries from 43 different nations, 150 plus organizations to pound ground in the nation of Peru. I wish I, I, wish I had time to tell you the story. We, had, uh, we went to 3,000 high schools in five days preaching Jesus with an altar call and a follow-up campaign for anyone that made an eternal decision. We gave out millions of pounds of food, millions of pairs of shoes, millions of blankets. We did 14 medical clinics in 12 different cities for seven days simultaneously in soccer stadiums with 1,000 medical professionals. We had firefighters for Christ training, trainings, political forums from kingdom leaders across the globe. We had everything you could think of, and then we culminated in the 
10 stadiums on the same night at the same time and never advertise one name. I, we've done 70 stadiums. You've never seen my name on them because I believe it's time to lay down labels, logos, and egos. And instead of asking the church to platform voices, I want to platform the local church. And so we watched in seven days with targeted outreach, 1.1 million people give their lives to Jesus and still be found in the church four weeks later. Those retention ratios are unheard of. We just mass mobilized an army in Los Angeles, 20,000 missionaries, as we began to approach America as a new found mission field where we did everything from medical debt relief. We paid off $47 million worth of medical debt for 23,000 families below the poverty line. We gave out $10 million worth of GIK, which is your beds, your dressers, your fridges, your clothing, 33 million pounds of food every weekend. We gave out uh, everything you could think of. We did rebeautification projects, upgrades to different schools and neighborhoods. We did homeless initiatives. We ran into the foster care system and started generating thousands of leads through the faith community. We hosted a historic men's gathering, had 100,000 and men complete a 30-day Brave Code Challenge, calling them in authentic manhood and fatherhood. And then we culminated into a stadium with unique favor from tier one artists and uh, icons like Justin Bieber and Chance the Rapper and uh, Jaden Smith and Tori Kelly. And on the streaming capacity between the in-person and online audience, half a billion people watched that one night. We thought perhaps there's a blueprint here. But you know how that started? We were standing in the office of the president of Honduras. He said, Mr. President, the country's in pain. Your homicide rate is here. Your suicide rate is here. Your poverty lines are extending, not decreasing. And we, we choose to believe that perhaps God is speaking to your nation through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 68 when he says, can a nation be saved in a day? Can a people be reborn in a moment? We said, Mr. President, we want to petition you for five things. Number one, would you stand with us two years from now in the largest stadium, the largest city of your nation, declaring Honduras as a new nation? Number two, would you open up all the borders so we can ship in millions of dollars of humanitarian aid with no red tape or hangups at the border? Number three, would you give us access to every high school in your nation so we can come and preach Jesus and plug anyone who wants to make a journey out of it into a local church, a faith community with, uh, within a certain kilometer radius of the school? Number four, would you give us the 18 largest stadiums in the 18 largest cities of your nation? And number five, would you underwrite all the audio-visual lighting uh, in those stadiums? You know, just some small asks to journey a world leader. President Lobos Sosa was so moved, he took a resolution out of his desk, signed it into motion, and it birthed the model that we called One Nation One Day through Missions Made. We get about 18 months into uniting the church, which is the biggest assignment that we feel like we have to do. We start rallying uh, the global church. People are coming. We've got an army of about 2,000 missionaries at this point. And we've got to buy, we've got to purchase plane tickets, but no major airline would believe that we could actually afford 2,000 plane tickets. They laughed at us. Some of them laughed at us. So we had to go charter our own 747. Well, once we submitted our, our plane paperwork to the Minister of Tourism office, the Minister of Tourism himself called us. Hey, you need to get to Honduras. We need to meet. We all meet face to face. And he says, I'm sorry, but you can't come. And I'm like, no, we, we coming. Like, there's five of us on the exec team. We're pretty hyper-focused. No, we're coming. He's like, no, you can't come. I'm like, no, you don't know me. I'm Hispanic. We get into everything, all right? We're coming, right? And he's like, no, no, no. You, you cannot come. We're like, why? He said, well, you chartered the wrong size plane. I'm like, what? He said, the largest plane that can land here at our biggest airport is a 737. We're category five, but you chartered a category seven plane. We didn't know anything about this. We're like, well, just throw some dirt out there and make the runway a little longer and we'll push that thing. I mean, we're just trying to figure it out. And, uh, and he said, I'm sorry, but you can't come. We're like, no, no, no. What needs to happen in order for us to land this plane? He said, well, you have to tear up all the asphalt. You have to put new lighting. You have to upgrade tech and radar in the tower. You also have to provide new emergency vehicle services to service this size plane. You also have to tear down pretty much half of their airport to service these. And you have to build us a bigger airport. And you have about nine months to do it. We're like, no problem. We'll do it. And they're like, how? We're like, we have a private funder. And we didn't do this. We're faith people in this room, but we didn't do this. He said, fine. I'll be waiting for the paperwork. And sure enough, in nine months... We watch new asphalt, 
new lighting, new tech and radar in the tower, brand new emergency vehicle services donated by the United Nations, got three different construction companies to work together to tear down the airport and build it back in record time, meeting all the regs across both local, state, federal, and global standards. And the first 747 to ever land in Honduras was filled with missionaries and ambassadors from heaven who were sent there to change it. Why? Because we, as the church, are the answer. The most sustainable vehicle of transformation in any sphere of society is the local church. It is not government, it is not business, it is not education. When wars happen, everybody leaves. Guess who stays? The local church. When sickness and disease runs rampant, guess who stays? The local church. When the world wanted better schools, guess who gave it to them? The local church. When they wanted a better system of government, who gave it to them? The local. It's always been the church. You're an answer. You're not the problem. You are not the problem. Our honoring towards scripture, these ancient texts, our spiritual tradition are not the problem. They're the answer. And I hope that this morning God would wake you up. Would you stand up with me? Perhaps I have some friends here who don't know Jesus. And the truth is you're having trouble seeing through this lens of could my life be different? Could God wake me up in such a way that my marriage would be different, my career would be different, the way I live my life would influence my babies and my children would be different? Friend, I'm here to tell you, that's exactly what I'm telling you. When you surrender your life to Jesus, He becomes the Lord, Master, Ruler of your life. You check in, you filter everything through, you find it in His Word, you do what the Word says. And I promise you, I'm telling you, there could be no better way to live this life than through that book and through Him. I have a marriage I don't deserve. My wife is amazing. I have four beautiful, godly kids. And the only way I got there is Jesus surrendering his, me surrendering my life to Jesus and Jesus accepting me. And friend, he's not in love with a future version of you. He's in love with you right now. If you have never surrendered your life to Jesus and you're saying, Pastor Chris, I, that's me. That's this moment. I want to pray with you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, you say, Pastor Chris, that's me. I'm tired of the games. I'm tired of the plastic. I'm tired of the frustration the pain, the addiction. I want things to change. The first step is surrendering your life to Jesus. If you have never done that, would you raise your hand in this room? I don't know if you're, they're streaming this online. We're gonna pray. Church, I wanna pray. And would you pray and repeat after me and pray with some volume. Say, Jesus, I give you my life. I thank you that you died for me and you rose again. And I declare that I am yours. You are my Lord and my Savior. I belong to you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, can we thank God for what he's doing in the room? I want to pray over the spiritual sight in the room. I understand sometimes we we look at ourselves and we're too little in our own eyes. What could my life do in Urbandale, in Des Moines, I don't know, Huxley and Ames and Ankeny? I, I, like, what can my life do? Your life matters. How you show up matters. And it's all about your spiritual sight. It, I want to pray, perhaps you've had blurred vision, foggy vision. But perhaps there's been spaces and places in your life. You're like, I have no sense of direction and it's a vision issue. I want to pray over us. I want to pray over us. If you say, Pastor Chris, that's me. This is ministering to me. This is ministering to me as a business owner, as a husband or wife, as a parent, just as a son or daughter of God. If that's you, would you take your hand and put it on your heart? I want to pray over us. I, I want to pray over us. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you would ignite spiritual sight. I ask that you would give us the opportunity to see what you are doing what you are accomplishing, and how you are releasing this on the earth. I call in the season the men and women under the sound of your word and your ministry and your anointing. I ask where there has been confusion, I ask for clarity. 
where there has been distortion, I ask for disturbance. God, where there has been difficulty, Lord, I'm asking for the strength of Almighty God to come on them through the sight, the lens of the Holy Spirit and the Scriptures. Wake up your men and women. Like it says in Joel, wake up the mighty ones. Prepare them. Wake them up. And I ask that you would ignite something fresh on the inside of them in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen, amen. Church, I want to I wanna ask for your help in something. About, uh, you want to bring that up? About three years ago, I called my kids into my living room and I said, hey, we're not doing Christmas this year. I'm canceling Christmas. And one of my kids, my youngest one was like, why are we broke? And I was like, well, you are, I'm not, but you are. And he said, uh, he, I said, no, mom and I feel that we need to challenge you to take a faith risk financially. And so instead of buying you Christmas presents, we take that money and you get to pick missionaries and ministries and everywhere else that you could sow into. And so my kids agreed, took about seven days, but all of them were on board and real tears coming down their face, like no presents. I'm like, well, just trust me. And sure enough, they sowed into places like Israel because we stand with Israel. Uh, they sowed into places like uh, missionaries, like the Dream Center, different pastors that have gotten close to them over the years. And, and uh, we wrapped pictures of all those ministries or people in picture frames, and then we unwrapped that on Christmas morning. The next year, I came in around the same time of the year, and I said, hey, we're going to do Christmas. And they're like, oh, thank God. It's materialistic kids, you know. I said, but your birthday's this coming year. I said, instead of people buying you presents for your birthday, they need to take that money because mom and I signed the four of you up. We didn't use our names. We used your four names. And you're supposed to raise $38,750 for an orphanage in Northern India. It'll be our 300th orphanage that we built. And I, I need you to raise the money for it. And I'm not calling donors and sponsors. I'm not writing emails or letters or anything else. You have to believe God. May he be with you. <laughs> and my kids were like, you know, after two birthdays, they recognized, hey, we're not gonna get this done. And so they came to me and said, Dad, you have some great friends. One of them is an artist. He designs for a lot of these major tours, like Taylor Swift's tour, Justin Bieber. He designs for all these major labels from Off-White to Louis Vuitton. All, he's a great friend. And I said, my kids were like, can you call this guy and I have him design shirts and we'll help him after yours and mom's messages that you travel with. And then we would take that money from the shirts and we would fund this orphanage. That's a brilliant idea. Sure enough, in seven months, my kids raised $38,750. And they have just complete, they're gonna complete construction of this orphanage at the end of this month. And so we are raising the final layer, uh, the phase two of traveling over there, covering all the costs to go over there uh, to do the ribbon cutting and spend uh, a good amount of time with the kids that are gonna be in this orphanage. And our family's truly excited about it. And so we have those shirts available. We have this one real quickly. Come on, this one's hot no pun intended, fueled by fire. Come on, you know this is amazing right here. Go and pick this up. I don't know how many of these we have left, by the way. We sold a lot last night. And then, of course, we have this one. I preached this message last night called Fearless. Come on, this ain't your normal church merch, all right? Go and pick these up and help us out. We also have some resources. Um, finisher. You know, I was, I, I was really moved by God one day. He said, I don't need my people to start. I need my people to finish. And he said, the world's impressed by what you start, but it's transformed by what you finish. And I think what God needs is a generation of finishers with people who understand the finish line in mind. And if you have a habit of procrastinating and never completing, this is a great message for you. I promise you, people tell me they laugh more through my books than anything else because I, I write like I preach. And so please go and pick this up. Be a great encouragement. We also have this one called Habits. I'm finding that a generation today needs to go back to the basics. My, Psalms 14.3, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? We need the basics to be absolutely effortless in our life. And I'm talking about the spiritual basics like Paul talked about. Let not slay again the foundation of elementary truths. I'm talking about the basics like how to pray, how to have an effective life in prayer or in fasting, how to read, meditate, understand the word, how to have a generosity driven life, a supernatural driven life, what worship is, not a service but a lifestyle. These are basic. And so this is an online curriculum done on video and you can follow along as this is the workbook. You can take notes and then we have all the uh, uh, access stuff in the back. Please go and get these. I don't know how many of these we have left. And finally, we have kingdom identity. I believe the biggest, listen, especially for parents, the greatest attack coming on a generation right now is in their identity. They're trying to push things like gender confusion at an early age. 
They're trying to get them to doubt who they really are. And the truth is, if you don't know who you are, you won't know who you're called to. Because calling has to do with a who. When I was a missionary in Sri Lanka, I wasn't called to the piece of land. I was called to the people. Are you following me? I have all these young ladies in, in our uh, college. They're always like, Pastor Chris, where's my Boaz? I need Boaz. Where's my tall, dark, handsome, super rich? Got to be rich. Lots of money, loads of rich, but love God rich, Boaz. And I'm like, well, when you become Ruth, you'll get Boaz. But Ruth could only become Ruth because she stayed with Naomi. David became King David because he stayed with the prophets. The disciples became apostles because they stayed with Jesus when everybody else left. Are you following me? It's so important. Go and pick this up in the back. I'll be back there signing books. Thank you guys for letting me be here. God bless y'all. I'll see y'all next time.